ओम नमो भागवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भागवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भागवते वासुदेवाय नारायण नमस्कृत नरम चाइव नरोत्तम देवी सरस्वती व्यास चतु जायमुतीर नष्ट प्रयशु भद्रेशु नि भागवत सेवया भगवतुतम श्लोके भक्तिर्भवति नैष्टिकी रीडिंग फ्रॉम श्रीमद भागवतम कैंथो टू चैप्टर सेवन टेक्स नंबर फोर्टी सेवन शश्वत प्रशांत मबयम प्रतिबोर मत्रम शुद्धम समम सदसता परमात्म तत्वम शब्दो न यत्र पुरुकार कवन क्रियार्थो माया परायत्य बिमुखे च विलज्जमाना तद्वाय परम बगवता परमस्य पुंसो ब्राह्मेति या विदुरजास्त्र सुखम विशोकम What is realized as the absolute Brahman is full of unlimited bliss without grief. That is certainly the ultimate phase of the supreme enjoyer, the personality of Godhead. He is eternally void of all disturbances and fearless. He is complete consciousness as opposed to matter. Uncontaminated and without distinctions, he is the principal primeval cause of all causes and effects, in whom there is no sacrifice for fruit of activities, and in whom the illusory energy does not stand. Purport. The supreme enjoyer, the personality of Godhead, is the supreme Brahman, or the summum bonum, because of his being the supreme cause of all causes. The conception of impersonal Brahman realization is the first step due to his distinction from the illusory conception of material existence. In other words, the impersonal Brahman is a feature of the absolute distinct from the material variegatedness, just as light is a conception distinct from its counterpart, darkness. But the light has its variegatedness, which is seen by those who further advance in the light, and thus the ultimate realization of Brahman is the source of the Brahman light, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the summum bonum, or the ultimate source of everything. Therefore, meeting the Supreme Personality of Godhead includes the realization of the impersonal Brahman as realized at first in contrast with material anibhuti. The Personality of Godhead is the third step of Brahman realization. As explained in the first canto, one must understand all three features of the Absolute, Brahman, Paramatma, and Bhagavan. Pratibodhamatram pati, is just the opposite... Pratibodha Matram is just the opposite conception of material existence. In matter there are material miseries, and thus in the first realization of Brahman there is the negation of such material inebrities, and there is a feeling of eternal existence distinct from the pangs of birth and death, disease and old age. That is the primary conception of impersonal Brahman. The Supreme Lord is the supreme soul of everything. And therefore, in the supreme conception, affection is realized. The conception of affection is due to the relationship of soul to soul. A father is affectionate to his son because there is some relationship of nearness between the son and the father. But that sort of affection in the material world is a full of inebriety. When the personality of God it is met, the fullness of affection becomes manifested because of the reality of the affectionate relationship. He is not the object of affection by material tinges of body and mind, but he is the full, naked, 
uncontaminated object of affection for all living entities because he is the super soul or paramatma within everyone's heart. In the liberated state of affairs, the full-fledged affection for the Lord is awakened. As such, there is an unlimited flow of everlasting happiness without the fear of its being broken as we have experienced here in the material world. The relationship with the Lord is never broken, thus there is no grief and no fear. Such happiness is inexplicable by words, and there can be no attempt to generate such happiness by fruit of activities, by arrangements and sacrifices. But we must also know that happiness, unbroken happiness, exchanged with the Supreme Person, the Personality of God, as described in this verse, transcends the impersonal conception of the Upanishads. In the Upanishads, the description is more or less negation of the material conception of things. But this is not denial of the transcendental senses of the Supreme Lord. Herein also the same is affirmed in the statements about the material elements. They are all transcendental, free from all contamination of material identification. And also the liberated souls are not devoid of senses. Otherwise, there cannot be any reciprocation of unhampered spiritual happiness exchanged between them in spontaneous, unbroken joy. All the senses, both the, of the Lord and of the devotees, are without material contamination. They are so because they are beyond the material cause and effects, as clearly mentioned herein, sarasat param. The illusory material energy cannot work there, being ashamed before the Lord and his transcendental devotees. In the material world, the sense activities are not without grief, but here it is clearly said that the senses of the Lord and the devotees are without any grief. There is a distinct difference between the material and spiritual senses, and one should understand it without denying the spiritual senses because of a material conception. The senses in the material world are surcharged with material ignorance. In every way, the authorities have recommended purification of the senses from the material conception. In the material world, the senses are manipulated for individual and personal satisfaction. Whereas in the spiritual world, the senses are properly used for the purpose for which they were originally meant, namely the satisfaction of the Supreme Lord. Such sense, sensual activities are natural, and therefore sense gratification there is uninterrupted and unbroken by material contamination, because the senses are spiritually purified. And such satisfaction of the senses is equally shared by the transcendental reciprocators. Since the activities are unlimited and constantly increasing, there is no scope for material attempts or artificial arrangements. Such happiness of transcendental quality is called Brahma Saukyam, which will be clearly described in the fifth canto. Vande ham Sri Guru Sri Uta Parakamalam Sri Guru Vaishnavam Scha Sri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raghunatham Bitam Tam Sajivam Sadvetam Sadvatutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Sri Vishakan Vitamscha He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bando Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostute Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vrindavanishwari Rishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vanchakalpa Trubascha Kripa Sandubya Evacha Patitanam Pavane Bio Vaishnave Bio Namo Namaha Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhara Sri Vasari Gaura Bhaktarinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Shashvat Prashantam Abhayam Pratilo Pratibhoda Matram Shudham Samam Sad Asata Paramatma Tattvam 
Shabdo na yatra purukara kavan kriyarto maya praita bibnke chavila jamana tadvai padam bhagavata paramasipungso brahmiti yad vidura jasra sukam vishokam. What is realized as the absolute Brahman is full of unlimited bliss without grief. That is certainly the ultimate phase of the Supreme Enjoyer, the Personality of Godhead. He is eternally void of all disturbances and fearless. He is complete consciousness as opposed to matter, uncontaminated and without distinctions. He is the prin principal primeval cause of all causes and effects, in whom there is no sacrifice for fruit of activities and in whom the illusory energy does not stand. And the Bhagavad Gita Srila Prabhupada mentions that it is for lack of a goal that the mind becomes, uh, becomes disturbed. Bahu shaka hyanantasya budayo vyabasainam. When one does not have a goal in mind, then the mind can go anywhere. Um, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. You can go in any direction. Om tad vishnu paramam param sada pashanti surayoho diviva chakshra tatam tad vipraso vipanyavo jagrivam saha smindate vishnuriya paramam param. But the, the transcendentalists, although they're walking here in this plane, their goal is always towards the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of God. They're fixed on the feet of the Lord. And that makes all the difference. Anyareva hur vidyaya, anyarahura vidyaya. The Sri Shapanishad says that the undisturbed authorities, the dhiras, have realized something beyond the material variety. Um, and they're teaching it to others through the sound vibration. And the, the verse says, that one result is obtained by worshiping the supreme cause of all causes, and that another result is obtained by worshiping that which is not supreme. All this was heard from the undisturbed authorities who clearly explained it. So hearing about the supreme personality of Godhead from a pure devotee is the only way to realize Krishna. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu instructed Sanatan Goswami, you'll find the teachings in the Madhya Lila, the Chaitanya Charitamrita, chapter 22, that it's not possible to understand the Supreme Personality of Godhead without meeting a pure devotee. And when one meets a pure devotee, one hears about Krishna. And uh, it's described by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu that he, one, one who's wandering in the material world, Brahmati Brahmati means wandering here and there, and he meets a pure devotee, he gets instructions and hymns. And he describes the, the devotee as a physician. He says the devotee is a physician. And when you meet that physician, uh, he can cure your disease. So the, uh, the only resting place for the heart, as mentioned in this verse, is in affection. Because this is the, the actual nature of the soul, to express affection. Prabhupada told about how he was sitting in his room in Vrindavan, and there's a little cage there outside to keep the monkeys out. But a baby monkey got in and separated from the mother outside, and the mother practically went mad. And Srila Prabhupada was trying to push the baby monkey out back through the bars and the mother was practically crazy. Prabhupada called the baby monkey a kitty. So the kitty came in, and, uh, and the mother was separated from the kitty, and he was pushing back out. And then when the, when the baby came back out again, that uh, she was pacified, she was satisfied again. And um, so that flow of affection is already there. It's coming, coming from the soul. It, it's a natural state of affairs. And in the process of devotional service, purification of the senses is necessary so that that natural affection which attaches itself to material objects or to other living entities in whom I have a, um, with whom I have a temporary relationship uh, becomes focused on the actual 
object of my affection eternally. Sanitya nitya sambandha prakritish chaparayavasa. Sri Brahma Samhita says, we have an eternal kinship with the Lord, with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But now, uh, somehow or other, one way or another, we've, I've fallen into this material nature and forgotten that relationship. And therefore, uh, it's a matter of remembrance, of waking up and redeveloping my affection for the Supreme Personality of God. Bhayam dvitiya abhini beishatasyad ishad apetyasya vipariyos ritihi. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu told Sanatana Goswami that because I'm in a reversed condition, I've turned my attention away from the Supreme Personality of Godhead, now I've become a competitor of the Lord. And I'm absorbed in that which is not supreme. Uh, and I've just quoted the verse from the Sri Shapanishad, which says, you get a different result when you, when you concentrate, when you worship that which is not supreme. It's endlessly frustrating, the material world. So, the, uh, the devotees of the Lord, the Lord himself uh, comes as Veda Vyas, Maya Mugda Jivara Nahi Swata Krishna Gyan, because it's not Swata, it's not automatic that someone can come out of this situation. And therefore, he comes as Veda Vyas and he brings the Vedic literatures. And also, the devotees go and broadcast this message about our relationship the supreme person, with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And by hearing that, we can awaken. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, it's like the poor man who is suffering because of his poverty. And then one day, an astrologer comes to his house. And he says, after looking at his chart, by the way, you're not a poor man. I've looked carefully at your chart, and actually, you're very wealthy because your father died, and he left you a huge inheritance and it's buried some distance away, and I'll even tell you where to go dig for it. Precisely how to dig for it. It's, it's nearby. You can dig for it in a, in a certain way on the eastern side of the yard, and you'll be able to recover it. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, when a poor man hears that he's wealthy, his countenance and his mood changes instantly doesn't take long. If you get a phone call and someone assures you that you've won the lottery, for instance, uh, that uh, your mood will change. No matter how sleepy you were or how morose you were, <laughs> you'll become... So Mahaprabhu said it's like that. It's like when someone instantly becomes... A poor man becomes a rich man, then he becomes happy in a second. So similarly, the sambandha jnan means our, uh, our knowledge of a relationship with, with Krishna is the thing that I've forgotten. And uh, the devotee physician comes and gives instructions and hymns by which to realize him. Instructions, we hear, uh, for instance, Prabhupada mentioned the Upanishads. The Upanishads are the first transcendental section of the Vedas. Upanishad means to sit up close when one has a, a hankering to figure out, why am I suffering so much? Then one can sit up close and listen uh, to, to a master uh, who's learned in the Vedas, who can tell him, this is why you're suffering. The, the prayers that personified, the Vedas personified also mention that sometimes a homeless person, well, allegorically, a homeless person may be wearing an inestimably valuable jewel around his neck, and then someone come up and remind him, hey, did you see that thing? No, right there. See, look. It, it's it's a, a, a jewel. It's around your neck. He's forgotten about it. So <clears throat> through instructions we hear about our nature and that we're not of this world. I remember the first time that I read Bhagavad Gita when I got to the chapter 2 and the section where it said, you don't die. Najayate mriyate va karachin. Instantly there was a burden lifted. I mean, I'd heard about it just in bits and pieces before that maybe that was a possibility, but it was so shrouded with, with doubt or that it was just a theory. I remember asking my, my parents sometimes, um, my brother, who's closest to me in age, we used to sleep in the same room. And uh, I remember sometimes at night, when falling asleep, we'd start a conversation about death. And say, what do you think it means? I don't know, what do you think it means? Well, this, that, we go back and forth. It's, I don't want to die. I don't want to die either. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. We run out of the room and run to our parents and say, we don't want to die. And they say, what happened? <laughs> and say, nothing happened. We just don't want to die. 
And they say, that's all right. That's it. You're not going to die and send us back to bed. And I was going to sleep thinking, well, how do they know? They're going to die too. And, but when I got the full uncensored uh, version from the Bhagavad Gita where it says, you're not going to die, I, I thought, now this is useful information. This is something that I c- can change my life. And this is the instructions that come from the, those who teach about Bhagavad Gita. And then hymns, the hymns come. The devotee physician brings hymns, described how the Goswamis, they drowned everyone with, with songs about Govinda. And by hearing that, those hymns, and they pass on these special prayers, uh, like the Hare Krishna Mahamantra, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu distributed to everyone and asked everyone to chant the Hare Krishna Mahamantra. And there are other hymns, like the Gayatri Mantra, Gayatri, it's the, it's the song that delivers you. It actually comes from Krishna's flute. Mentioned in the Brahma Samhita, Atavenu Narada Satrai Murti Mayigati Spuranti Pravivesha Su Mukab Jani Swayambhava. From his lotus mouth, the flute emanated and Brahma heard it. And that translated from the mouth of Brahma into the Brahma Gayatri Mantra. And then after he heard it, then it manifested again as the Kama Gayatri Mantra. So all these hymns are being passed down like ripe fruits from the top of the tree and they get passed from one devotee to the next to those suffering in the material world who can take that. And um, all of these are meant to reawaken our affection for the Lord, our original affection that's there. And you can see that your affection will attach here, there, and everywhere in this world. But by the concentrated process of devotional service, which means uh, hearing uh, the instructions, taking the hymns, these specific hymns, they're like medicine. They actually cure um, my wayward mind, which is attaching itself to many different objects in this world and becoming frustrated endlessly over and over again by that process and fix it on the form of the Lord, the name of the Lord, the qualities of the Lord. And all these things uh, will then rekindle the original affection that I have within my, within my heart. <laughs> Rupa Goswami in Upadesha Amrita speaks about the process of devotional service, and he, he begins by saying, uh, Vacho Vegam, Manasakroda Vegam, Jihwa Vegam, Udaropasta Vegam, Etan Vegam, Yo Vishaheta Tira, Sarvam Apimam Prithivim Nashishya, that you have to control your senses. There are all these urges. So that's the first thing, process of yoga. There's some sense control. And then he talks about all the things that will ruin our devotional service, and then all the things that will guarantee our success in devotional service. And then he talks about association with devotees. Dadati pratigrinati kuyam akyati pritchiti bhunkte bojayate chaiva sadvidhim pratilakshanam. That there's a kind of a way that devotees associate together by exchanging gifts, by um, revealing their minds to each other, by, exchange, by giving prashadam and accepting prashadam. And he calls this pritilakshanam. And um, Prabhupada says that our movement is based on this, on this exchange of love between the devotees. And so in the cultivation of our affection for the Supreme Personality of Godhead, it's also a prerequisite to develop affection for the devotees. And to, to learn, as is mentioned in the next verse by Rupa Goswami, Krishneti, Yasya, Giritam, Manasadrieta, etc., where he speaks about how to associate with different kinds of devotees at different levels of advancement. One, um, one who cultivates loving friendships and relationships with the devotees and the loving exchanges will um, become satisfied in devotional service. It's a necessary process for advancing in devotional service, and it is also... Um, pleasing to Krishna, as mentioned in the Srimad Bhagavatam in the section of the Prachetas, when they cooperated together out of love uh, to follow the instruction of the Lord, uh, Lord Shiva mentioned that the Supreme Personality of God became very pleased with them because they cooperated. And um, <clears throat> my observation is that uh, cooperation is among the most severe austerities that, that one may be asked to perform. Um, because, uh, you know, if I perform austerities solo, uh, I go off to the woods or something like that, I only have to deal with my own mind and senses. But when I, when I endeavor to cooperate with other devotees, 
Well, oh, it, it requires a uh, tolerance. It requires a, a, a wide uh, angle of vision, um, a broad vision to accommodate an accommodating kind of vision. It, frankly, it requires maturity to, to be able to cooperate with, with other devotees and go on with devotional service. And um, this requires affection. So... Um, affection is, is, is all-powerful, actually. Um, I would say that um, it's what everyone's looking for. For instance, if we, um, if we offered someone here uh, all kinds of material facilities, for instance, um, a palace to live in, if we gave Mahatattva Prabhu a palace, and within that palace we filled it up with all kinds of um, material facilities like what? A soft bed. A full refrigerator. Anything else? A hot tub. Excellent sound system. Big screen TV. Internet access. Actually, we're not going to give them internet access. No, I'll tell you why in a second. Huh? Only three. We can give them 300. 300 rolls, no chauffeurs. The reason is we're giving him all kinds of material facilities, but no other living being. He can have whatever he wants. So he lives in this palace, and he has all, all material facilities, whatever he wants, just no other living entity. Now, if he stayed there, of course, we picked the wrong person because Mahatap is in touch with the super soul, so he'll be satisfied. But what else? No dog. No dog, no, no living being. Only material uh, facility. Then an ordinary person, not Mahatattva, but if an ordinary person was given such facility and sat there for a week, two weeks, they would become mad, actually. You know, my friend Satyadev told me when he was a paramedic for 20 years in San Francisco, that he'd get 911 calls frequently from old people who were shut in. They couldn't go outside anymore. They were afraid to go outside. And they became so lonely that they would call 911 because they were about to expire due to loneliness. And he would come sit down with them and just have, make a cup of tea and sit and talk to them for half an hour. And their shaking would subside and they'd, they'd feel some satisfaction. Chaitanya Chandra Prabhu was telling me about someone that he, that he had visited, where they were just so lonely <laughs> that, that uh, just to visit them, you know. So in this palace, if one green parrot flies into that palace after two weeks, it would become that person's best friend because it's a living being. There's some, there's some kind of reciprocation there. So what we're searching for ultimately in life is not any kind of material arrangement or facility. It's actually the relationship that makes one happy. And as Prabhupada's bringing out in this purport, I'll just read this one poetical line again, where Prabhupada says that when the personality of Godhead is met, the fullness of affection becomes manifested because of the reality of the affectionate relationship. He is not the object of affection by material tinges of body and mind, but he is the full, naked, uncontaminated object of affection for all living entities, because he is the super soul or paramatma within everyone's heart. In the liberated state of affairs, the full-fledged affection for the Lord is awakened. Questions or reflections? Yes, Rajri Narayan Prabhu. I'm working on a question, but you ended abruptly. But as far as your example with Mahatatwa, uh, my son sent me an article, and it was uh, somehow that was all about torture. At what they've been doing in Iraq and Guantanamo and all this stuff. And it, all, it said that the greatest suffering, the greatest punishment, that which they fear the most is isolation. You can whip them, you can waterboard them, you can do so many, but isolation. And they said it was the same thing through World War I, same thing with the North Koreans, same thing in Vietnam. If you, it, they take these big gangbangers, big tough guys, they leave them alone, isolation, they cry for their mother or crawl up the walls. Mm. It's the worst punishment. Proven psychologically. If you want to have someone completely collapse psychologically, that's how you do it. 
Yes, thank you. Yeah. Siki Mahini Prabhu. Yeah, I have to bring up a little negative part of this. <laughs> well, just for the, the uh, contrast. Affection is there, and so you could almost say the opposite is the envy. Maybe you could speak about that in relation to affection. Because affection seems to give you something nice, but we have to deal with envy. That's not so nice sometimes. Yeah, that's true. Uh, the envy I hold in my heart uh, prevents me from appreciating others. And that is, that is a, um, in itself, it, it, it chokes off my, my air of life. As the air of life is, is affection, appreciation, gratitude for the devotees, for the Supreme Personality of God, and ultimately for all living entities, for everything. Aham sarvasya pravavo matak sarvam pravartate iti matva bhajante mam buddha bhava samanvita. A person who's become freed from envy uh, sees that everything comes from Krishna and therefore is, is constantly you know, uh, feeling appreciation and gratitude for everything and for everybody. Uh, even those who are... Um, uh, apparently, uh, competitors. Uh, he feels gratitude. Tate nu kampam susimikshamanu bunjana evatma kritam vipakam. A person who is advanced in spiritual knowledge sees all cir circumstances as the mercy of the Lord. And uh, whatever kinds of things come, he tolerates, uh, knowing that um, he's caused them himself. Um, when there's a principle Queen Kunti speaks about in her prayers called grinati, which means uh, appreciation. This is a principle of devotional service, to appreciate the service of others. And when I appreciate others' advancement in devotional service or others' service, then by dint of that appreciation, I advance myself in devotional service. When I have envy in my heart, the opposite is true. It, it chokes off my, my air. I can't allow my heart to open and actually appreciate what somebody else is doing. And um, envy rests within the heart, and then when it comes out through the tongue, it becomes especially dangerous because uh, words which are tinged with envy can actually pierce the heart of another and cause great damage. And therefore, um, it's a, we're especially warned to be careful about sadhuninda, or criticizing devotees, because um, that can destroy our devotional service. So if envy is there within the heart, uh, I should contain it, and I should um, work on the process of the curative, which is taking uh, devotional service. Uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, criticizing devotees is like poison, whereas glorifying them is the antidote, and it, it actually reverses the effect. So... Uh, as I gradually become free from envy, I can appreciate the messages of the Lord and the Srimad Bhagavatam, etc. It's meant for the non-envious. It's the, the Paramahamsa Marg. So um, it's there, and through etiquette and also through austerity of the speech, I should control my uh, letting envy come out, because then it, there, are, there are serious consequences and effects. Yes, Badri Prabhu. All right, if, if the, I'm thinking of a two-way street. Are you saying that even though I may have envy in my heart, not that I'm trying to cultivate it, but just certainly in my case, it's the natural default mode. So it's there, but if I control it coming out, that will help also dissipate it? Or is it just a full stop, or is it actually curative by not speaking it? Well, one thing is, uh, this first verse I mentioned, vacho vegam manasakro de vegam, these vegams, these pushings. Uh, naturally, when I resist the vegas, when I don't give in to them, then I objectify them. It means I can step back for them and see them for what they are. There's a, creating a gap. Just like sometimes people, they react to something and they ruin their whole life. I read about a story of a man on a motorcycle and another man in a truck and they were dueling for, for the lanes out of anger, and the man in the truck just lost his cool and ran over the guy. And he had a family, and the, I mean, you know, he, was, he lost his... 
objectivity. And in that minute, so uh, Krishna says lust or kama is our eternal enemy. And he, he tells us in the Bhagavad Gita, jayato vishayam pumsam sangas teshu bhajayate, etc. How by connecting ourselves with the objects of the senses, um, then I identify with them. When I identify with them, I take them on as a, I become burdened by them. Um, but through the process of yoga, I distance myself by controlling, for instance, my tongue. Before I speak, I, I don't say it. Uh, I, I, I withhold that because I've, I've heard that uh, the austerity of speech, to speak pleasingly and beneficially, and uh, avoiding speech which offends. One should also recite the Vedas regularly, etc. When I do that, there's an opportunity for me to actually um, look at it. Like had the man not swerved his truck into the, into the um, motorcycle rider, then he might have cooled down for a second. So, yes, there's a way in which we actually uh, get to see the difference between that impulse and myself. And when I do, then... Uh, I observe the fact that, you know, I don't have a vested interest in this body and a vested interest in um, being a competitor to others. In fact, those who are uh, brahminical, they're in the mode of goodness. The reason that they become peaceful is and non-competitive in that way, non-envious, they develop these qualities, is, the reason is because they see their self. What is the, the benefit of that? The benefit is the self is, is complete in itself. As, as Srila Prabhupada is mentioning here, there's a satisfaction in just knowing that you e exist. Like motive, motive passion means I'm always trying to become something else. I'm moving. Whatever I get, it's not enough. Here's a million dollars. Why didn't he give me two? He had five. He could have given me two. It's, it's, and, and then if I, if I become mayor, I start, you know, my wife says, well, you should have been... Uh, you know, um, the senator. And, and it, you know, it, it moves on. There's always more that I can do in the mode of passion. In the mode of goodness, I know I already am something. I don't have to become something. I exist. I'm eternal. One can see the eternality of the soul and feel some satisfaction. When I identify with the body and the senses, then there's a feeling that, um, of insufficiency that I'm always trying to make up for. And this is one of the elements of envy. So by the process of purification and actually seeing myself through, uh, for instance, the process of japa and japa, sitting and meditating on, on the holy name and hearing over and over again and, and seeing uh, how the mind is working, the mind actually is a creation of the mode of goodness, according to Lord Kapiladev in the third canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam. It's a vessel created from the mode of goodness. The, mind, the intelligence is in the mode of passion. It's always discriminating how to move ahead. <laughs> That's mode of passion. Mode of goodness, it's just a vessel, but now it's become filled up with all kinds of um, counterproductive information and impulses, vrittis, impul uh, impressions that I've gathered from here, there, and everywhere. Cheto darpana marjanam. But by the process of chanting Hare Krishna, I can purify that. And it's not mechanical, ultimately. This is the, I'd like to say it's not mechanical. It's a relationship. And that's one of the points of this purport. Our... Um, our process of yoga is not mechanical. Nothing's mechanical. In fact, we were reading last night how Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was saying, uh, jnana is weak, karma is weak, uh, mystic yoga is weak. They're all weak. Even Varnashram is weak and doesn't have any result unless there's some bhakti involved. And to the degree that there's bhakti mixed into anything, it has success. And I, therefore, the point is that uh, it's our relationship with Krishna that matters. And to the degree that, that we connect to that relationship, it's to that degree that, that we will um, experience satisfaction, we'll just experience our own wholeness. And when I have that, I don't envy other people. So, um, affection, yes, Arjuna. Uh, just a comment on the topic of envy. There was a point when I was about six or seven years old, I was very envious of my father because I wanted his position of head of the household. And my mother, she saw this and she said um, to me, you know, the only way I'm gonna cure you this envy for your father is that if I make you do a lot of service for him. So my father would come home, um, he would work all night, and uh, she would make me uh, go there and I would have to take off his shoes, and I would take off his socks, and I would give him a foot massage, and I would hand wash his socks. And she had me do this personal service for him for several months. And uh, at the end of several months, I was totally cured of my envy. 
Because no matter how strong your envy is for someone, if you get in that position where you're serving that person, eventually it will turn around and you will find some affection for that person because you're always serving them. Very nice point. Very practical. And, and it uh, parallels the verse I brought up earlier, Bhayam Dvitiya Abhini Beishita Sad Ishara Petasya Viparya Yosmriti Tanmaya Tad Buddha Abhajetan Bhaktyaika Yesham Guru Devatatma. One of the Yogendras, Kavi Yogendra, says that our predicament in this world can actually be cured by doing just as Arjuna Prabhu has said, and that is to concentrate our attention on serving the Supreme Personality of God and the Spiritual Master with full attention. Bhaktyaika Yesham, with full bhakti, bhaktyaika Aisha, only concentrating on that, that, that will, cha- will turn us around. We'll become free from it. There's uh, one minute left. Hare Krishna. Sometimes in, amongst devotees, we develop a non cooperative relationship with somebody and rather than reconciling that relationship we just try to carry on in devotional service and just kind of ignore that person and avoid them and they may simultaneously avoid us and we may not want to stay in the same room with that person but we still want to be devotees and we want to serve Krishna and cooperate together does the, do these rela- these uh, conflicts have to be reconciled? Yes, before? they have to be reconciled. Conflicts must be reconciled, and and I recommend uh, don't make ultimatums, and um, never say never because there's always a way. Time and mercy can work out so many things, and if it's actually my intention to work things out with others, then um, there's great advancement in that to to uh, purposefully. Uh, work things out with others and find a, find a solution. As soon as I make an ultimatum and make a stand, I uh, block myself from a lot of advancement. And so that goes back to the point of cooperation. I mean, what is co- cooperation? You have to work side by side with other people. And uh, there's great lessons to be learned in, uh, in <clears throat> learning the art of how to cooperate with others. Uh, for instance, um, you know, oftentimes I may assume that people think in a certain way or they have a, a certain motive for doing something, and therefore I'm, I'm fighting against that uh, assumed motive that they have. But when I actually talk to them more deeply, I'll find out that they actually had a different motive in mind, or that um, sometimes it only takes a little thing to, to turn some of these things around, but they can be held strongly held positions over many, many years. And if there's, there's some kind of um, reconciliation, um, sometimes the reconciliation is, of course, to agree to disagree. And uh, sometimes, I mean, now that I'm thinking about it more, there's, there's a way in which uh, we can cooperate from a distance and give people space. I think about the, the verse that is in the Srimad Bhagavatam, which mentions the ways that a, a Madhya Madhikari deals with different people. Ishvare Taradine Shu Bali Sheshu Du Satsucha Prema Maitri Kupopeksha Yakaroti Samadhi Maha that the Madhya Madhikari devotee is um, shows all love towards the Supreme Personality of God and makes friendships with the devotees. He gives pours in as much mercy as possible to the innocent and avoids those who are Dvishatsu or envious. So um, learning the art of uh, avoiding people's envy is also part of cooperation. If someone's envious towards you, then um, rather than become more tangled up in it, um, learning to, to avoid that, that envy is also beneficial. That sounds circular because I said you should resolve everything. <laughs> so, <laughs> so let me just uh, conclusively, you know, I'll finish with this point, and that is that um, Compartmentalizing and 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 uh, learning to not allow uh, conflict or um, that may that may arise between uh, different people we have in this world, either by avoiding them altogether if that's necessary, or to the best extent of, out of good faith, trying to work it out with them in such a way where there's uh, 
a win-win situation. Forgive the cliche. But to the best of one's ability, that's pleasing to Krishna. And working on that is part of uh, how we develop affection. Sometimes the best friendships, the, 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 the best bonds take place from those who were previously at odds with each other, and then they were able to resolve it. It makes for a very strong society when there are outlets for that, and people don't uh, just automatically shut themselves off. It's a very um, neophyte kind of a mentality. Um, those who are flexible are stronger than those who are not flexible. A man on, the, uh, on an airplane was telling me about physics, and he was saying the strongest elements are the most flexible ones, like water. <laughs> it's very powerful because it's so flexible. So in, in flexibility, there's a lot of strength. I didn't leave you with much, but little pieces here and there, so you can sort them out afterwards and not enough time. Um, I've taken it uh, more than my allotted time. I thank you very much. All glories to Srila Prabhupada and his beautiful purports. All glories to Srimad Bhagavatam. All glories to the assembled devotees. Go Premanande Hari Bhagavatam.